The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome everyone to the Occupational Therapy Australia webinar on sensory processing and impact on everyday life with Professor Winnie Dunn. Um, my name is Sandra Melbourne and I'm the National CPD Coordinator with Occupational Therapy Australia. Before we commence, I'd just like to cover a few housekeeping points. This webinar will run for approximately one hour and it is being recorded. Um, I have muted all attendees in order to prevent background noise coming through. Um, so if you've got any questions, please type them in the questions section as they come up and they'll be answered at the time. Uh, finally, there is an orange button in the corner of your control panel which you can click in order to minimise the panel. So I'll now hand over to you, Melissa. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Kelly and I'm the unit coordinator and lecturer of the paediatrics unit here at um, Curtin University in Perth. And I'm here to officially welcome you all to this exciting webinar series which is entitled Sensory Processing and Impact on Everyday Life. So I will be moderating today um, and the next two webinars from the point of view of managing the questions presented to Professor Dunn. So I guess I'll be, I'll be putting them in in a timely manner and, and if, we, if we get similar questions, I'll collate them so that, um, that we can make sure we're getting the most comprehensive information from Professor Dunn. So we today are very lucky and very privileged to have an expert clinical leader and advocate for sensory processing to present today's topic. So, and today it's uh, learning by examples, incorporating sensory processing knowledge into one's comprehensive and occupation-based practice, a toddler case study. Professor Winnie Dunn is a renowned occupational therapist and author. She's a professor and chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy Education at the University of Kansas in the US. And in addition to this, she's a clinician and serves on numerous professional advisory boards. Professor Dunn's research is directed towards how individuals understand and use the sensory input they receive and how their sensory processing abilities affect their performance in everyday life. She's published more than 100 research articles, book chapters and books, including her book Living Sensationally and has spoken around the world about her work. She's the author of The Sensory Profile and more recently The Sensory Profile 2 and these assessments have been translated into dozens of languages and are used for both professional practice and in research programs. Professor Dunn has received numerous awards for academic contribution to her field and teaching and today it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Professor Winnie Dunn. Thank you, Winnie. Hi. Well, I have to say good morning to all of you, but um, it's good evening for me because it's about 8 o'clock on Thursday night here in Kansas City. Um, I'm really happy to be here. This, um, this request to look at case studies really warmed my heart because uh, how we uh, use sensory processing knowledge in service to the needs of families and teachers and children is the thing that matters the most. Um, this series that we're going to do, um, tonight we're going to talk about a toddler and the toddler's uh, sensory profile and the concerns and needs of the family. Uh, next week we're going to talk about a child, an older child in the home environment. And on the third session, we're going to talk about a student at school so that we get kind of a wide range of, um, of sensory profiles and life circumstances that are common to children under our belts. So let's get started. So tonight we're going to talk about a little boy named Kiefer. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Kiefer is two and a half years old, and his family uh, really wants some help with um, bath activities, uh, bath time and personal hygiene like uh, brushing his teeth and um, eventually they also bring up some um, needs they have around meal time. So let me give you some background about self-calming um, in his history. He always cried when he was being held and uh, he cried a lot when he was riding in the car. Um, he, uh, he also, uh, by his parents' report, withdrew from situations when he was upset by shutting down, uh, which is the word that they used. Uh, he'd stop interacting with his parents, and uh, what concerned them the most is he stopped interacting with his favorite toys when he would uh, shut down. His family visited a developmental team to get help when he was younger, and they consulted with a developmental pediatrician. 
They also worked with an occupational therapist and a developmental psychologist at the time. And they gave uh, Kiefer a diagnosis of regulatory disorder, which is from the 0 to 3 manual. So across time, because he's two and a half years old now, um, his self-calming abilities have improved, but he continues to have a really limited diet, and he resists his parents during self-care activities, like bathing and brushing his teeth. Now, here's a moment for us to just pause, because um, when, ch when parents have children, especially an only child, uh, they don't always know what other children of the same age are doing. And I think most of us who've been around children a lot know that two-year-olds are resistant <laughs> to some of the daily activities such as brushing the teeth and bathing. So um, sometimes it's important to help parents know, even though they're concerned and we're going to address their concern, you know, that these are things that lots of parents of two-year-olds are dealing with. So in this case of Kiefer, the OT that was on the team had been consulting periodically with the family since he was very young. Um, during infancy, they had completed the infant sensory profile too, and so the OT decided that uh, they probably needed to complete the toddler sensory profile too at this time. And this is important if you haven't used the infant version. Um, the infant version is for um, children from birth to six months. And it really is more of a, a, a screening type tool because there's only a few items uh, be, because babies have a, a limited range of uh, behaviors. And the only decision that you can make from the infant sensory profile is do we keep following this child or are things seeming to go okay? So uh, since the infant sensory profile too said we needed to follow Kiefer, He's been on people's radar during this entire time. Anybody have any questions or comments at this time? I haven't had any presented yet, Winnie. Okay, so I'll keep going. All right, so this is a, a screenshot of um, the kind of scores that you would get from the toddler sensory profile. And this is basically the score summary. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail. So the first thing that is important to notice, especially when you're dealing with parents of young children, is uh, what scores are in the just like others range. So um, if you're not familiar with the sensory profiles and how they are organized, just like others <clears throat> means that the child's score fell in the middle part of the bell curve. So this means that um, Kiefer's performance or the reports from his parents suggest that his registration score and his seeking score are just like other children that are two and a half years of age. So that's an important thing when parents are feeling concerned for us to sort of point out that there are some scores where Kiefer is um, engaging in behaviors the same way that other children his age are doing. And that's also true for the visual processing score here. So since we know that uh, visual cues are an important part of children's uh, lives, we can keep that into our minds uh, as a strategy for perhaps using it as a strength to provide Kiefer with some cues as we develop a plan. Now when we look down um, at the highlighted section um, I've got on the screen now, we see that Kiefer has a much more than other score in avoiding and sensitivity. So um, avoiding and sensitivity are both low threshold scores. This means that children who have um, a high, much more than other scores in these areas, it means that they have very low sensory thresholds. They notice a lot of things. And so they're going to be reacting to more sensory experiences in everyday life than other children. Um, this is not surprising to us because we have this history of the regulatory um, uh, features when he was younger, and so it's not surprising to us, but having the data from the sensory profile validates um, or triangulates the data that the parents have been telling us. 
So this is a time when we could pair up a story that the parent told us about Kiefer's regulation with these scores and say, you know, he's really noticing a lot more things than other children. So this might be why he's reacting more often than others um, in his everyday experiences. So if we go on and see, um, we might, we are looking back up now at the sensory section, we might ask ourselves, like, I wonder what sensory systems are contributing to this uh, low threshold responding that we see. And we see up here that um, the highlighted ones right now are touch and movement, that Keeper has um, a more than other score and a much more than other score in movement and touch, respectively. Now, more than others means that it's, um, his score is between one and two standard deviations above the mean. And much more than others means that his score is more than two standard deviations above the mean. So the much more than others column tells us that Kiefer's responses are more frequent than 98% of his peers. And the more than others score is telling us that Kiefer's responses are um, more frequent than about 84, 85% of um, other children his age. So we can kind of see here that the touch and the movement um, are, are probably contributing to his avoiding behavior uh, score at the bottom and to his sensitivity behavior at the bottom. So we're going to keep our eye on um, opportunities related to touch and opportunities related to movement. In, in a first blush, we're saying that um, he's having trouble with bath time and with uh, meal time and with toothbrushing. There's certainly a lot of touch activities going on during those activities. There's texture in the mouth, the, the water in the bathtub, and the splashing, and the towels, and the textures. Um, but we also have um, touch experiences going on. Um, movement might be because of how mom's moving Kiefer around in the bathtub. Uh, there's lots of things we're going to want to explore with the parents to find out exactly how these activities look so we can pair them with this touch and movement score that they've already reported to us in a standardized way. Okay, so um, we tried to think about what we should plan for the future to help the parents discover ways to get better at these routines. And so um, we also wanted to uh, focus on the strength of the visual system and pair that with um, the contrasting score on the auditory system. Now here's a situation where um, it's very common for parents to be using their voice to talk to Kiefer. Um, he's an only child, so it might not be as noisy in the house as it would be if he had a lot of siblings. But um, it might be better for the parents to start using visual cues, for example, uh, when they're trying to get him to engage in these routines. So that's another thing that when I'm looking at these scores, I would be thinking about questions I want to ask the parents to find out a little bit more about how they um, give him instructions and whether they talk all the time during the activities, which is very common with young children. But in the case of Kiefer, there might be some times when being quiet would be more useful to him. So these are all the thoughts that kind of go through my head when I'm looking at the scores, just to understand um, what might be going on. So in fact, I did ask, um, we did ask the parents, um, you know, about this auditory score, and they actually did not understand how noises would interfere with um, Kiefer's day. Um, the therapist noted that Kiefer seemed to notice sounds more than his peers from the scores, um, and asked the parents about whether this was uh, interfering with his concentration. But his parents said that while he tends to be distracted by noises, he doesn't stop from doing the activities um, even though he seems distracted. So that's an interesting little twist to the story. Um, we can't make assumptions about what a score means without really talking to the parents ourselves. So the, parent, the therapist was really happy to have the parent's perspective on this, and um, she wondered um, if perhaps the sounds in the home were more familiar and he had more experience with them, and so he'd acclimated to them, and um, kind of wondering for the future 
whether uh, going, for example, to a preschool program would be more um, challenging for him because uh, the, the sounds would be um, more intense and less familiar. So that's something that we would have to explore as he uh, got towards um, school age or if they were sending him to preschool. Does anybody have any comments or questions here? No, Winnie, we had, we had a question about the auditory system, but I think you've, you've answered it, so that's fine. Okay, good. Thank you. I love it when that happens. <laughs> Actually, Winnie, may I ask a quick question? In your experience, okay. as, as, a, as a preschool environment becomes more common, would you see a child acclimatise as such to that in a similar way that they have done to the home environment? I, I don't know. You know, this is at this point it, um, with the child this age. This is just a hypothesis. Um, I think that I think the difference in a preschool program. You know, families can get very routinized um, in their daily schedules, especially if they have a child that's been fussy. Um, but I don't see a lot of preschool classrooms getting completely routinized. You know, the teacher no. might have a general schedule, but. Um, uh, the the teacher the idea that the teacher's in control of everything is uh, not actually the truth. <laughs> no, that's uh, true. The only routine is that it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, the routine, the routine is at the mercy of the other three year olds or the other four year olds. Perhaps. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's go on and um, think about bath time and um, toothbrushing and uh, how this conversation went with this family when we started planning some ideas for intervention. So um, the parents told us that the, the morning routine was grueling. Uh, that was kind of a word that they used. Um, he refused to have his teeth brushed. He refused to have his nails clipped. Um, he, he really wasn't very happy during bath time. And so uh, the therapist used task analysis um, to kind of get at some of the details of what was going on, to get a good observation about uh, how the parents were engaging in this routine with Kiefer and to see if there were any particular triggers that were making um, Kiefer sort of fall off the rails. So she was really focused on um, the touch and the movement um, because these seem to be very prominent sensory features of toothbrushing and bath time. So touch sensitivity seemed to be the culprit um, for the, the clippers and the toothbrush um, where uh, Kiefer would kind of um, grimace and move away, uh, not unlike probably what many of you have seen. Um, so, so she talked a little bit about those with the parents. But when we talk about the bath time, we have the situation of the soap and the water and the washcloth. Um, that all are contributing from a touch standpoint as well. Uh, so these are very uh, sort of high-risk situations for a child that has sensitivity um, and avoidance to touch. Um, his movement reactions uh, seem to be um, also being triggered by things that, that maybe the parents wouldn't notice. For example, you and I might notice a child um, bending over the sink to spit and his head getting moved into a different plane. Those are things that parents don't think about as movement, but you and I notice them as movement related to changing the position of the vestibular organ against gravity. <clears throat> against gravity. And so even though um, the parents would tell you that he's just standing there, um, we know that there's some other activities going on there that might be triggering that sensitivity as well. Uh, in the bath time, um, uh, Kiefer was uh, sitting in the bath and, and then mom was tipping his head back uh, to, to uh, rinse his hair. And that seemed to be the time when uh, Kiefer kind of uh, got a little bit more upset. And again, this is not an unfamiliar thing or an unfamiliar pattern that we would see with children, but it is something that we want to point out to the parents because when we talk about movement processing, a lot of times parents only associate that with the child 
moving about in the environment. They don't think about moving the head. And so that idea of what movement means to us and how we're talking about it to families, we have to be very careful about that so that we don't um, kind of cross each other without really communicating about what's going on. So um, the therapist uh, shared information about uh, ways to make adjustments to the materials and the supplies that you use in the bathroom. Um, and that might be more arousing to, to uh, Kiefer and things that might be more calming for him, especially related to this touch and movement. For example, um, um, as a way to be playful, his, um, his mother would sort of splash him in the bathtub. And uh, I'm sure you all just hearing that think, oh, you know, that's not such a good thing for a person that has low thresholds for touch experiences. So um, t explaining that the splashing water, hitting on the skin uh, might have uh, some, cause some reactions is always helpful. But the, the um, therapist also talked about uh, the idea that the water could be helpful to Kiefer and made a suggestion that the parents um, fill the tub up a little bit farther so that his all of his legs and that his hips would be under the water because the weight of the water creates more of a touch pressure sensation and as we know from our neuroscience um, dust off those neurons uh, the touch pressure on the surface of the skin goes through the dorsal columns in the spinal cord and it goes directly to the sensory motor cortex to uh, provide information about your body awareness and body scheme without sending any collateral fibers to the arousal networks um, in the reticular formation and in the brain stem. So by, by getting him in deeper water, we can take advantage of the weight of the water uh, pressing on his skin to give him some more organizing and calming uh, touch input, which would reduce the opportunity for the more arousing input like splashing or other things to be more bothersome for him. And so the parents said they would be happy to, you know, put a little bit more water in the tub to um, try to accommodate uh, that with Kiefer to see how it went. And as I said a moment ago, she tipped his head back um, to rinse his hair. And um, so uh, the therapist and the mom discuss different ways to get his hair rinsed so that uh, so that he wouldn't have to have that jerking head jerking back uh, to get his hair rinsed off. So um, one of the suggestions that the mother had in their discussion was uh, putting a big piece, um, a couple of big um, pieces of foam in the tub uh, so that it'd be more like a uh, recliner chair in the tub for Kiefer. And um, so the parents actually tried that and it turned out to be a really helpful strategy. Um, I think that if we think about a task analysis for ourselves on the phone, that's also providing a more um, bigger body surface being touched as Kiefer sits on the phone and it gives away a little bit. A wider space of his skin is being touched by the foam than would be touched by the bottom of the tub. So we're, ta we're getting another advantage of getting more touch pressure input into his system um, and reducing the amount of that kind of point-to-point -point input that you would get on the hard bottom of the tub. Um, and actually when she did that, uh, Kiefer seemed to be m much more relaxed and mother had a much more satisfying experience. Um, she also um, explored uh, with the therapist's suggestion, different washcloths and different hand placements to, um, you know, use the whole surface of the hand instead of kind of poking at Kiefer when she was um, helping him to um, uh, get bathed. And uh, she tried out several different textures of cloth to, um, and, for, and uh, they talked about touching him firmly with the cloth when um, they were washing instead of kind of the tickling feeling that you would get by just ru rushing a cloth by his skin. Um, 
the dad actually came up with an idea of raising the temperature. They had a heater in the bathroom of raising the temperature in the bathroom itself so there would be less of a difference between the water and the air in the in the bathroom. And you know, when parents have ideas like that, it's always good um, to support them, you know, to give them some ideas about why that's a good idea, and then to let them try it. Even if you think it might not be a great idea, the idea that the parent has been thinking about it and has a, a reason to come up with an idea, it's really um, it's really good in the studies we've done with coaching to let the parents try things and then come back to them and say how to go, you know, why do you think it went well or why do you think it didn't go so good, what do you think we could change about it, that process of letting them experiment, um, what the families have told us in our studies is it helps the parents feel more confident themselves that they can solve a new problem that comes along. So that was an example of a time when we were able to just really support um, the dad to try that out and um, you know he felt good about coming up with an idea and um, he seemed to feel like it went really well by doing that. We always want to support the parents to feel competent as well. Okay so there was one other thing that was interesting about this, um, this family. The therapist went back and looked, as many of us do, went back and looked at some of the items that the mother had marked on the sensory, on the toddler sensory profile too. And she had marked several items that sort of suggested that um, Kiefer was resistant to cuddling even though mother had never brought it up as a concern and she hadn't really um, talked about it in all of their conversations. Um, she, um, during their interactions, uh, during these activities, the, the therapist also noted that um, Kiefer had a lot of negative responses like pulling away and crying when his mother was trying to hold him um, and tr you know even trying to comfort him and that this seem to have um, an upsetting effect on the mother, as you would expect. So um, knowing that some parents have some resistance to bringing up things like this because they think it makes them look like a bad parent, the, um, the therapist uh, tried to um, bring it up a different way because uh, she, didn't want, she didn't want to embarrass the mom and she she um, knew that a possibility was that the mom was thinking that Kiefer doesn't like her, or that she's a bad mother. There's a lot of, a lot of um, other ideas laden on these things that you and I look at as sensory processing features. So um, to try to explore this area without um, being disrespectful to the, um, to the mother, the therapist um, offered some strategies for um, using calming touch while holding Kiefer in the context of bathing because there were natural opportunities to wrap him in the towel and you know pat him dry and carrying him in and out um, holding on to him when she's picking up the supplies and uh, so she thought well that's a context that we're already working on and I can give her some strategies and maybe she'll start to pick up the ideas of how to do it and generalize it to other situations. Um, again, the, mo the therapist talked a lot about the firm pressing and using the full, full force of your hand instead of the fingertips. And um, one of the things in their conversation that the mom did say was that um, um, Kiefer had dry skin and that she wanted to put lotion on him. So they, uh, the mom came up with an idea about having a game where they put lotion on each other, um, you know, that, that Kiefer would put lotion on the mom's hands or on the mom's uh, shoulder, and they would uh, reciprocate as a way to create a play situation where the parent and the child can um, bond in a different way that's not so threatening. So again, we could apply the, the firm touch and all those same things to the lotion experience. Um, of course, the dad wanted to warm up the lotion because he was all about the warmth of everything. And so that's what they did. And um, this process of them engaging with each other 
uh, with the lotion seem to um, help mom to relax a little bit and not have so many um, uh, negative, um, the therapist was noticing less and less of the parent being more cautious and guarded because um, I think she was feeling more competent because she was developing some strategies to help herself and Kiefer bond. Um, you can imagine if you have a child that's very sensitive to touch that it's hard not to take that personally. So um, I think it was really nice how the therapist um, kind of broached the subject without um, being disrespectful of the parent's um, guarded nature about it. Okay, does anybody have any questions about any of that or comments? Winnie, I haven't had any questions, but I have had two comments um, just about the foam recliner and people saying that what a brilliant idea and to think about it from a proprioceptive point of view as well. So that was helpful. Oh, Thank nice. you. Oh, nice. That's good. You know, sometimes uh, we get, we get uh, well, how, I don't know the right word, the, the idea of um, those everyday things that people come up with, like we always have to sort of step back and ask ourselves, you know, how can we get how can we get a bigger surface and how can we mm -hmm. provide more you know that's a natural way to get it with the natural weight of the child and and foam is a good substance because it gives way you know it's not hard and so it mm -hmm. it by the very fact that you're sinking into it gives you more skin contact which is um, was a really good thing in the case of kefir absolutely so, um, that they often get so caught up on the vestibular side of things that they, they forgot about <laughs> they forgot about the proprioceptive side. So that was Yeah, and I'm telling you guys, proprioception is your friend. When you don't know what to do, always start with proprioception. The cool thing from a neuroscience standpoint is that proprioception um, does not send any arousal fibers anywhere. It's just an organizing input that helps the children and us know where the edge of us is, where we end and where the world begins. And so whenever you're sort of feeling unsure, always, you know, sort of, uh, not to make a pun, but to fall back into the, into the proprioception options because it's, it's a nice way to begin because you have a low risk of overstimulating a child uh, when you're using mm -hmm. proprioception in the activity. Okay, Thank so you. let's go. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. So let's think about uh, meal time. So after we sort of got some of the uh, bath time things going and uh, the parents were feeling, you know, uh, my experience with uh, young children is that parents, you know, will be very intense on a certain area and then they'll start getting some ideas and they start giving me um, feedback so that I can see that they understand the concept of what we're doing, not just doing what I say, but understanding the underneath rationale for what I'm saying, that they start generating their own ideas. And then they kind of want to back up, you know, they want us to leave them alone a little bit. Let me experiment. You know, you still check in with them. You still talk to them about it. But but you, you kind of let them go a little ways. And so while that was happening, uh, we turned our attention to the mealtime. So the parents said that Kiefer typically refused new foods when his parents introduced them. Not something that we're unfamiliar hearing. Um, they said that he would even refuse familiar drinks if they weren't offered in a familiar cup. His parents had been introducing a few bites of a new food on its, on, um, its own plate with its preferred foods on the table that he could still see uh, when he finished with the new food. That was their strategy, which, you know, um, parents are really creative. You know, they were really trying. They, they had this, you know, the idea of food is so primal for parents, you know, that it's sort of how they decide that they're being good parents, you know, if they're not uh, providing nutrition. There's something very, very powerful about that. So I thought this was a really clever idea. You know, they put the food in front of him and they put the preferred food in view. Now that can also backfire, but um, I, I always want to really um, support families when they're trying to come up with ideas and then we can, we can kind of reflect back to them how to go, why do you think it went okay, or why do you think it had trouble as we go. 
So um, the therapist um, um, explained that by doing that, they were trying to help Kiefer manage the amount of new information, which here's another thing that's important about sensory processing. You know, that's a cognitive deal. Um, the parents helping him manage the new with the old, it's actually a more cognitive strategy, even though the reason why they're having to do it is a sensory processing feature. So does everybody understand that? It's, it's like we don't have to always do a sensory intervention just because we know sensory things about an activity. We can build the sensory characteristics into the plan we make but the surface of the plan can be a cognitive one or a cognitive behavioral one. And this is particularly important when we get um, to older children and we're dealing with um, psychologists and educators and others. Um, but it's, it's important even with young children that sometimes a cognitive approach is a way um, with building in the sensory feature uh, to still get the job done. So. Um, the parents trying to help him to manage new information, what their idea, they said, was to try to increase the number of things he was familiar with, which we know from developmental literature with typical children that um, this is a very um, helpful strategy, children just being exposed to no, new foods. And exposure doesn't just mean um, like having it on the plate. Exposure includes them seeing it in the kitchen and seeing it in the refrigerator and seeing it at the grocery store and you know the, all the experiences of that food um, count as exposure. So um, a lot of times we think about exposure only being when we're eating something, but the truth is that any type time we encounter that food, it counts as an exposure. So it was a good idea, but it wasn't, um, they were trying not to force Kiefer, but it still wasn't, um, it wasn't really expanding his repertoire very well. He was very, very um, focused and narrow on the kinds of uh, foods that he would eat. But the thing that was really good about what the parents were doing was that they were trying to create a supportive environment um, around the meal time with the family eating together. And, and I always want to support families to do that. So the other thing um, that I noticed about this strategy was that parents didn't know this, but you and I do. They were introducing the food visually. They had the food that was new and the food that was familiar both present. They didn't say, well, you can have your preferred food after and have it be like an um, abstract thing somewhere else, which is an auditory stimulus, which we know is a difficult thing for Kiefer to process. We know his visual system is working just like everybody else's. So putting the food right on the table is a great strategy to support his strength in visual processing. I thought that was, um, so the therapist pointed that out. You know, the, you remember visual is a strength. This is a way to foster his strength. So um, this, this was a good idea, but it was still very stressful. You know, uh, Kiefer still... Um, was unhappy and expressed his unhappiness. Uh, the parents kept saying they wanted him to have proper nutrition um, and they were feeling frustrated about that because of his narrow preferences. Um, so as you can imagine, he was still throwing fits and um, uh, accepting the new foods was still difficult for him. So the therapist and the parents started exploring some other options for how to get, um, you know, I don't think we should focus so much on, you know, the kid has to eat the whole food pyramid or we have to have this nutritionally balanced caloric intake. You know, sometimes it's just about, you know, looking at the preferred foods and trying to find nutritional um, ways to embellish the food or ways to um, add to the thing that he's already eating. So they, the family maintained this structure of um, the situation with the visual, and they thought about how they could change. We, um, the, the conversation turned to, how can we change one thing about the food that Kiefer's already eating? So um, one of his preferred foods, for example, was noodles. Um, and so 
um, that was a good thing because they could they could um, cook the noodles. For example, they cooked them cooked the noodles in chicken broth so that there would be some a tiny bit of protein um, as part of his meal. But uh, they wanted to they just the parents decided that they wanted to try to add even tiny little strands of meat to the noodles. Um, now their idea was, and this is again good thinking was that the chicken's the same color as the broth and the same color as the, as the noodles. Um, you know, they're, they're listening to us about the visual strength of the option. Uh, so they think, well, the, the shreds of chicken are going to match the color. They're going to match um, the flavor because it's chicken and the broth is chicken. Um, so. I love it when, when people start coming up with ideas like that. Well, if it's visual, then if we just put something that matches, um, that, that's always good to foster those kinds of ideas. So they started out by putting um, uh, just like two or three little tiny shreds. Like it would take you all day to find them. But of course, I'm sure you know what's going to happen is um, Kiefer found the strands and picked them out. You know, he, he he zeroed right in on it because people that are very sensitive to changes in texture are going to notice those things very quickly, just like um, Princess Winifred felt the pee with all those mattresses. You know, they just are able to notice. So then we had some more problem-solving sessions with the parents, and the mom came up with an idea. She says, how about if we change uh, the shapes of some of the noodles, you know, because they'll still feel the same in the, in the way that, that he eats them, you know, but visually they'll be a little bit different. Uh, they'll still taste like noodles. So she started um, uh, taking pasta and like crunching it up a little bit so that it would be different shapes. Like there might be some tubular ones like spaghetti um, kind of chopped up a little bit and mixed in with other flatter noodles. Um, without changing anything else, without changing the flavor, you know, still cooking it in the chicken broth. And um, the thing I love about that suggestion is that it tells me she's thinking, you know, she's listening to us talk about using his visual strength. She's listening to the idea that to be respectful to Kiefer, we want to keep thing, uh, things as similar as possible, but expanding in some way. So um, that was the next thing that they tried. And uh, actually, that turned out to be a pretty good, a pretty good suggestion. Um, so mom got kind of excited. She kind of started changing the noodles around. And after they were able to change the noodles around and get it kind of um, expecting the unexpected, if you will, you know, where they were different shapes, you know, each time that he would eat noodles. Um, then they were able to sneak a few shreds of chicken in, and um, uh, over time, I'll tell you what the outcomes are here in a second. Um, he was able to eat a lot, a lot more protein in his meal. Okay, so does anybody have any comments or questions about that part? I haven't had anything at the moment, Winnie. Okay, everybody's probably making noodles for their lunch. <laughs> okay, so I always like to kind of say, you know, talk about what happened, you know, like proceed out for, you know, two months, four months, six months to kind of see what happens because, you know, families start getting some traction like this and they start, you know, trying stuff and, and then, you know, they're doing really good and then they get frustrated and they call and you kind of re-guide them. So um, I just wanted to kind of give you a summary of some of the things that happened. So um, in, a, in a check back about three months after the time I was just talking to you about, um, mom said that Kiefer started to smile during bath time, which um, was just making, you know, just she just beamed about it because she'd been so, you know, that underlying feature of, feeling like your child doesn't like you, it's really hard. It's really, it, it sort of takes a toll on a parent. So she was very happy about that. And she said that laying him um, in the, with the big foam sponges or the big, big foam block um, really was a helpful strategy that um, Kiefer felt more, you know, he, you and I know he felt more supported, but 
it made him relax and then of course what does that do with a parent it makes the parent relax so again we're we're building in the sensory features to the activities but we're using on the surface other kinds of approaches you know like we're using coaching and you know we're letting the parents have some success um, along the way that aren't just sensory activities for them some of the things they're doing are more cognitive in nature um, the therapist uh, also found out that um, they had experimented with a lot of these different cloths and the mom found this one brand of those bath puffs you know the the really soft um, puffs that are made out of um, um, netting uh, and uh, there was she found a brand that uh, Kiefer liked and so she bought several colors and so one of the things she did was she let him pick which one he wanted to use when they went in to get to get the bath and so again we're using a we're using sort of a cognitive approach to support a sensory feature um, they also um, sort of expanded on the lotion routine to um, use these puffs to scrub each other so um, Kiefer would scrub mom's arms and hands or her shoulders and and then um, it would be mom's turn and so then mom would be able to scrub the parts of, um, of Kiefer that um, might have gone unwashed <laughs> on some occasions because of how difficult it was and uh, the thing that was really lovely about this part was um, more than Kiefer getting bathed because you know it wasn't like he was you know not being cared for um, this through the bath time and through the therapist really good skilled um, deep thinking you know looking back at the items and figuring out this this characteristic of mom's distress and and sort of uh, working that into the problem that the parent said they wanted help with instead of trying to make it be a new thing um, we were able to give this mother so much satisfaction with her uh, relationship with this young boy so um, during um, the feeding uh, period um, th they had some hiccups you know where he wouldn't take the food but by a three-month checkup he was um, he was um, doing more uh, about 25 percent chicken so like in a bowl of noodles with the with the broth, the little bit the broth that's left from uh, cooking the noodles, he they had slowly increased. Uh, they made they cut up the chicken to match the shapes of the pasta. You know, parents do all kinds of crazy stuff because they're just so intent on being successful for their children. And so across time, about three months later, um, he would eat a bowl of noodles that had about a fourth of the space filled up with the chicken and so um, they felt really successful with that and so they were on the on the road to trying to add some other things in to the to the broth uh, but I thought it was really great that they got they were really focused on the protein and so that's what um, we just kept you know having them focus on so um, during one of the visits, uh, the, the therapist even observed that mom was sitting and uh, reading a book with Kiefer, and uh, dad even dad said that he could carry Kiefer like a baby monkey on his back um, with a blanket. So it wasn't Kiefer just holding on; um, he was responding to that idea of providing touch pressure, and he was kind of not exactly swaddling him because he was just wrapping the blanket around Kiefer's back you know like laying him in like it was a sling and then getting it up on his back so Kiefer was very secure and he had all that touch pressure from the front um, against his dad's back and then he had all that touch pressure around his backside and his uh, shoulders because the blanket he, the dad was pulling the blanket tight around him and I thought that was a really um, that was a neat idea for the dad to come up with instead of just kind of carrying him and swaddling him like a baby he was treating him more like a toddler or a preschooler 
and um, they felt like the the tantrums that he had, um, these strategies for holding him um, were were ways to kind of calm him down. And so again, he wasn't stopping all the behaviors, but the pa we were arming the parents with more more um, wisdom about what was triggering those temper tantrums so that they could employ some other ideas to um, to sort of uh, get him back to neutral or to calm him down because they understood what might have triggered him in the first place. And I think that's that's the most powerful thing we can do for families is help them feel competent at um, uh, intervening at seeing the early warning signs, at trying to juggle the different variables, the sensory processing knowledge arms them with additional ideas that are very concrete that they can use and feel like they're really in charge of their child and, um, and keeping their child really happy. Okay, anybody have any questions or comments? Winnie, I've just had a comment um, that somebody has just mentioned that they have just noted the importance of co-regulation and how lovely it is to hear about the positive effect on um, on Kiefer's interactions and relationships with his parents. So yeah, I think people yeah, are that, that really that, so. you know, I um, across my career, it's become so clear to me that. Um, when we when we keep focused on the children, especially the young children, when we therapists get we we love babies and we love toddlers and we pick working with children for a reason because we like them, and yet um, we're really stealing away the parents' um, opportunities when we do things with the children instead of supporting them to do something with their children. And I think this whole idea of creating opportunities for the parents to feel more competent is a critical, we're at a critical juncture in OT where we really need to foster that idea in ourselves because um, there's nothing better. I mean, we think, oh my God, I love you know watching this kid grow and do all these great things, but there's something really, really soulful about a parent saying something to me like, you sat here and listened to me, but I did this. I figured this out. Like, um, if you've never had that experience, um, trust me, it, it's, it's equally satisfying for us as therapists to have a parent feel like they know what to do and they know when to call us when they've reached a juncture where they need some more support. Thank you. Haven't had anyone else ask anything yet. Okay, I'll wait a minute. Yeah. I want to give them a preview of our little person for next time before we close. I've got a comment in that I just think it's lovely hearing the practical examples because so often we do these things but we lose, I, I know you do it so often that you start to wonder if it's actually working or if it's just what we, you know, are we making all of this up? So for even for me as somebody with a lot of experience, it's actually very reassuring to hear an yeah. expert like you who's done the research saying all these little practical things that we're just building into everyday activities are, are what we should be doing. Yeah, and that we need to do some metacognition with ourselves, you know, like to recognize that we might, it might be appropriate to use a cognitive behavioral approach even though the information we had to start with was sensory. You know, that, that, that we're doing a t an activity analysis on the things that we're observing, not just on the things the child's doing. And that makes us better therapists when we take the pause and think about our own thinking as well. Um, Winnie, may I also ask the, the setting um, that this therapist provided intervention to Kiefer within? Because I know one of the, the challenges that we face here in Australia is 
uh, you know, limited time with the children that we see, yeah. or if if a par if the um, family is accessing services privately and paying for them. Yeah. Obviously, money is is a consideration that needs to be made. So I'm just trying to get a picture of the content. Well, you know, in this the story that I just told you, um, it was in. Um, the child was still in an early intervention setting, and so in in America, in those settings, the uh, the therapists uh, go to, you know, we say the home, but actually we go wherever the parents would like us to go. You know, like they might come meet them at the playground or um, wherever. Obviously, this in this case, it was the bathtub and the the usual spots. But um, I got to tell you guys, I. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this again, I think in week two or three, I forget. Um, we just, we're just now finishing up a study. Um, we did a, um, a coaching intervention a couple of years ago, um, a study that's similar to some of the that you guys have done in Australia. And we had really good findings. And we did 10 sessions with the families. And with some of the families, you know, after about half the sessions, um, we had some sessions on Skype. Um, or other other media of that sort, and uh, so we asked ourselves, you know, do we need to have those initial contacts with the family in person to develop the rapport, so that those other sessions were also effective? So we just are now finishing a study that was completely we did all coaching, and um, so we didn't we didn't you know touch the children or anything, but we did all telehealth, we did it, all. we used Zoom because Zoom has a higher resolution, um, but every session we did with the families was by um, the computer. So some of the parents used their smartphones, some used a tablet, some used their computer, um, but all of our sessions were about an hour long and they were all using the technology and we are getting like soaring goals met and uh, the parents confidence is going up and like everything that you would dream to happen is happening the the technology did not make one bit of difference um, in fact I think in some of the case some of the data we have better outcomes so the bonding the, the parents sense of intimacy with us the their willingness to bring stuff up none of that changed and we still got really good outcomes never meeting any of these families. So, you know, I think this is really powerful data for a country like yours where you have, I mean, in Kansas, we have similar things where we have these really dense populated areas and then we have these vast um, miles and miles and miles of, you know, just very low population. One of the families, we saved them about I don't know, I think it was like $4,000. We The closest OT was 120 miles away. So we calculated mileage and time off work and babysitters. And I mean, it was a lot of money. And we yeah. got really good outcomes. So I feel really hopeful for, um, you know, distributed um, populations like you have and like we have, that this is a really good model for us to start using and understanding that we're we're giving families tools with our minds not with our hands you know we're we're um i'm, I'm just really excited about that uh, yeah okay. it'll be interesting to see where it goes in the future yeah yeah and um winnie i do just have another question somebody okay. asking it's quite it's a really good one and i'm sure something that a lot of people will be asking to themselves, but in the situation where there's a sibling, and I guess there's that additional um, sense of unpredictability as um, siblings can bring, but how can you give some examples of how you've managed to integrate the sibling into the intervention? Well, um, like in this case with um, Kiefer, you know, if he'd had a sibling, then um, I, I probably would have um, given the sensory profile to the sibling to find out, you know, what the similarities and differences were so that I could help the parents schedule the best times for the sibling to be interacting and then the times when I might give the sibling a job that would get them away from what we were doing. Um, but like, you know, getting um, getting this, the um, soap and the washcloths and all that stuff in the bathroom and 
um, you know, finding things like that, uh, uh, helping to cut up the meat, helping to cook the pasta. Um, and then, you know, depending on what the, child, the other child's sensory profile is, um, you know, we could talk about which parent would do which activities with which kid and, and the idea that all four of them didn't have to be together. You know, that would introduce a whole other level of awareness of, you know, families don't always have to be together <laughs> to True. You know, be a happy family. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. All right, I think... Um, I think that wraps it up. I'm, I'm just keeping an eye on the question bar to see if there's any last minute final questions, but people might well, process things. And... I'll introduce our little girl for next time. Her name oh, is yes. Jean, and she's a five year old and um, she needs to be able to ride in the car with her parents uh, to run errands and have outings. Um, she doesn't, um, she's not doing very well um, with getting in the car. So um, that's what we're going to talk about next time. And this family has some really creative ideas as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Winnie. I look forward to that. I know, uh, I know. I know that immediately makes, uh, makes me think, oh, I wonder what's going to happen because I'm sure we've all had families yes. we've worked with where we know the car is a major issue. So yes. but I'd just, just like to thank you and thank everyone else for their participation and, um, and yeah, for you for sharing your examples and your knowledge. And I will see everybody on Thursday Australian time next week and an email will go out confirming the times as well. Thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. I uh, you. hope you all have a really good day. We've loved it. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.